Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and we have a few stories to go through today. We're going to start off talking about The Boring Company and their collaboration with Tesla. We have a new update on The Boring Company's Las Vegas project. We've also got a new report on how Tesla is handling quality control, a couple of updates on Tesla Solar, a recall for Model S and Model X, and it's been a while since we've talked about short interest on Tesla stock. For a while it hasn't really been all that interesting, but we do have an update there that has shown some movement. First up is The Boring Company. We have a report from the Las Vegas Review Journal that the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority approved a pair of agreements with The Boring Company. The first to provide up to $6.25 million for The Boring Company to operate their loop system under the Las Vegas Convention Center from February 1st this year through June 30th next year. The second authorized The Boring Company tunneling access to connect their convention center loop with a broader citywide loop in Vegas. So where Tesla gets pulled in here, as many of you know, is that the Boring Company plans to use Tesla vehicles in these loop tunnels rather than what would traditionally be an underground tunnel, a subway train. The Boring Company believes this will allow for faster, more efficient travel because unlike a subway which would stop at each stop along the way, these individual Tesla vehicles could go essentially point to point without having to stop. So you could go from the first station stop all the way directly to the 10th station stop without having to stop at stations 2 through 9, for example. They compare it to an underground highway system where you would essentially have these on-ramps and off-ramps, or I guess, on-tunnels and off-tunnels, which would connect what they call their main artery tunnel to the individual stations or stops. So anyway, they plan to use Tesla vehicles for this because there are no emissions, that's obviously critical underground, the vehicles are extremely safe, and finally, because of the autonomous capabilities. This is really a perfect early use case for a fully autonomous vehicle because it is just one lane, everything is extremely clearly marked, the entire environment should be very well known. So getting back to this Las Vegas Review Journal article, the most interesting part about this is they say that, quote, until the end of 2021, the Teslas will be operated with drivers. At the end of the year, the LVCVA expects the system to run autonomously, and at that time, the LVCVA would renegotiate terms of the operations deal with Boring, end quote. Having now had a fair amount of time to use autopilot on the highway, I would actually feel pretty confident in the timeline that they're laying out here. Of course, Elon has said that he really believes that full level 5 autonomy will be achieved by Tesla this year. I'm definitely skeptical of that. I don't think that's going to happen. We'll certainly see a lot of progress, but for a use case like this, I think it should be pretty much ready to go. I think it's good for them to start with drivers first, or at least someone there that's monitoring that can take control if need be. But this is about as simple of a use case for autonomous driving as you could find. So in terms of a commercialized service from Tesla, even though of course this will be under the boring company name, this may be the first one that we end up seeing. Things seem to be certainly getting close to being operational here. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority actually has a live webcam showing the construction here, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Occasionally you can see Teslas popping in and out of those tunnels. I think the original plan was for it to be ready to go for CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, which started in Vegas a few days ago, but that went online only, so I'm not sure if that deadline moved because of that. Either way, I think we should be expecting to hear a lot more about The Boring Company and their relationship with Tesla this year. Next year, we've got some pretty interesting information coming from a Tesla job listing. This was found by Electrek. Tesla is looking for a quality inspection engineer, which they will be asking to, quote, lead the installation and operations of automation camera inspection systems into existing manufacturing lines. End quote. Under job responsibilities, they say that they want this person to own the designs for new automated quality inspections created with the help of vision technicians and other engineers and lead the day-to-day -day work of the team to implement those inspections. So as a concept, this is not necessarily new. We know, for example, that BMW uses some camera-based stuff for portions of quality control, and I would be pretty surprised if Tesla is not already doing some of that as well. But I think it's interesting because Tesla is probably trying to push the envelope in that area a little bit further. If we go back to that responsibilities, it says own the designs for new automated quality inspections. Much has been said about Tesla's quality control. We've, of course, talked about that a lot on this channel. And sometimes, you know, I think people feel like Tesla doesn't necessarily care all that much about those things, but I think job listings like this run contrary to that. And I do think we've seen a lot of progress over the years, and hopefully that progress can continue. In this particular instance, it'll be interesting to see if Tesla can at all leverage their experience with their full self-driving efforts, as well as Project Dojo, in areas like this. All right, next up here, I wanna spend a couple of minutes on Tesla Solar. We have a video today that was published by a roofing company in Colorado, Weddell & Sons Roofing, which shows a time-lapse of them installing a Tesla Solar roof in just one day. I'll put the link to that full video in the description. They note this was a 12 kilowatt system, so pretty decent size, on a 30 square roof, not a 30 square foot roof, so a 30 square roof is equivalent to 3,000 square feet, 
which is about an average size for a roof. As for the size of the team, they say they had eight installers on the actual roof, three on ground support, and although they did install the roof in just a day in about 12 hours, they had previously completed the tear off of the old roof as well as the underlayment for the solar roof because at that midpoint, they needed to have an inspection done. So not the entire project being completed, I would also assume that Eleven is a fairly large team for a new install, but there does seem to be progress here and the possibility of this even happening, I think is a good sign. Another update here on solar that may or may not end up interesting, there is a new customer for Tesla Solar or prospective customer for Tesla Solar that has posted on the Tesla Motors Club forum and said that their advisor for the sale told them that they are going to be switching to using new quote unquote Tesla branded inverters. Over the years, Tesla has used a variety of different inverters, I believe primarily from Solar Edge and Delta. And this person here does say Tesla branded. So that doesn't necessarily mean that Tesla is going to start producing their own inverters, but I did think it was interesting enough to pass along and it's not an area that I know a ton about. So I'll definitely look to the comments for help on how or how not important that might be. Next is an update from the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration or NHTSA. They have asked Tesla to recall 158,000 Model S and Model X vehicles manufactured from 2012 to 2018 due to failures in the media control unit or MCU. They note that the flash memory that Tesla is using has a limited program and erase cycle count, after which the memory is worn out and the MCU becomes non-functional. The memory is integrated with the processor, so I believe Tesla would have to replace the entire unit. Not 100% sure on that, and it's always tough to estimate how much recalls would actually cost the company, but in this case we do actually have some context because Tesla does offer an infotainment upgrade for $2,500 to upgrade the MCUs in those older vehicles. I would assume the easiest path for Tesla to take with this recall would just be to do those upgrades on the affected vehicles. Maybe they'd use a cheaper part, I'm not sure, and of course who knows how much margin Tesla is making on that upgrade. But if that were a zero margin thing, then the maximum cost of this recall would be $2,500 times 158,000 vehicles, which would end up just shy of $400 million. Again, not saying that's the cost, but that probably provides us with a decent estimate for a ceiling for how much this could cost Tesla. That's the nice thing about having cash on your balance sheet. That's the de-risking that we talk about. Obviously, Tesla can easily afford that at this stage. So not the news that everyone was hoping for on the S and the X. Obviously, a lot of eyes on if there's going to be a refresh and what's going on there. I'm still not hearing much. I did see a tweet today from the account Alternate Jones, who wrote, quote, got a call from my Tesla advisor. Refreshed Model X is expected in March 2021, end quote. So again, as always, take that with a grain of salt. Plenty of incorrect information has come out of those types of sales channels in the past, and a refresh there could mean something as simple as, oh, now the chrome is gone and black trim is in. Nevertheless, did want to pass that along. Next up, we've got the most recent update on Tesla stock short interest. So we haven't talked about this in a while, but there is some pretty interesting movement here since the S&P 500 inclusion. If you're not familiar, the short interest numbers are published twice a month. There's about a 10 day lag period there. So we just got the December 31st short interest update. And between December 15th and December 31st, remember inclusion date was the 18th, Tesla short interest increased by almost 15 and a half million shares, up to 60.6 million shares sold short. That's about a 34% increase over the span of two weeks just in the share count sold short, but of course the price also rose over that period of time from about $633 per share up to about $705 per share, so short interest increased from about $28.5 billion to nearly $43 billion. From a dollar's perspective, that's about a 50% increase in short interest, again, just in two weeks. From a share count perspective, I think that's the sharpest movement we've seen in either direction throughout the course of 2020. The 31st, that's a couple of weeks after the inclusion date of the 18th, so it really makes you wonder what the short interest was on the 18th, because I think a lot of that float that would have been acquired by these S&P 500 tracking funds was probably supplied by short selling. Of course, we'll never know what that number is, but if there was a higher short interest number on the 18th, and that has come down to the 31st, that, in addition to the other things we've talked about, like some of the benchmark funds probably buying as well, could explain some of the price action that we have seen since inclusion. So short interest, at least for a little bit here, has started to become a little bit more interesting to follow. Our next update will be for the January 15th date, but that will not come until January 27th, Wednesday after market close, which coincidentally is when I expect earnings to be. A couple of final notes for today. The first is on ARK Invest. They've actually filed for the creation of a new ETF exchange traded fund called the ARK Space Exploration ETF. It'll trade under the ticker symbol ARKX. I know a lot of people are fans of ARK, myself included, so it should be exciting to see what they hold in that fund. And I'm sure what a lot of people will be wondering is if they manage to include any SpaceX in there. So definitely something we'll keep an eye on. 
Incidentally, if anybody does have experience with ETF management, I do have a couple of questions there. So if you do, please reach out on Twitter at Tesla Podcast or via email at tesladailypodcast at gmail.com. Lastly today, I did just have a couple more thoughts on yesterday's episode about Neo Day. So first of all, thanks a lot of really great discussion in the comments yesterday. I especially like the discussion when we're actually not in agreement, which when we bring in other companies happens more often. But I did just want to reiterate a couple of things because sometimes I think people have, I don't know, selective listening or just take a little bit less emphasis on parts that I spend a little bit less time on, which is understandable. But a couple of things that I said yesterday that I just wanted to, again, reiterate, that was not meant to be an exhaustive look at NEO. It was meant to compare the differences in strategies that NEO discussed at NEO Day with some of the things that Tesla is doing. So when they're both aligned, it doesn't really make sense for me to talk about it. Yes, both pursuing electric vehicles is a great thing, but I think we all kind of know that already. So I'm focusing on the differences and my take on the strategies that cause some of those differences to occur. Second thing I'll reiterate, which I did say yesterday, is that just because I don't agree with some specific elements of Neo's strategy doesn't mean that the company can't be successful, just that I have more confidence in Tesla's strategies and therefore their success. As for the comments, a lot of really good discussion on battery swapping, so I do have two final thoughts on that. The first is that a lot of people pointed this out as Neo really trying to be that premium automaker, really giving this as an additional option, which Yes, maybe I should have clarified. I thought that was clear. Obviously, you can also charge all electric vehicles. So most of the comments either centered around there's nothing wrong with providing that additional option to customers with a big portion of other comments saying that I just don't understand the China market and how people don't have dedicated parking spots, so they need battery swap. I did say yesterday that I do understand that there are differences between the North American market and China. Certainly, I'm not going to have as good understanding as someone on the ground in China. But yes, I do understand that there are differences. So I think both of those points can be addressed with a similar thought. We'll start with the first one there about this just being an extra nice to have option. And yeah, stuff like that is great. And NEO definitely seems to have a lot of access to capital, a lot of government support, and they actually do get a little bit of a subsidy because they do have those swap stations. But the point that I really wanted to try to get across and I'll, against my better judgment, I'll try to get across again today is that there is an opportunity cost for everything. Even if this is just an extra nice to have feature, that still reduces the possibility of offering another extra nice to have feature somewhere else. Nobody has unlimited time or unlimited funds or unlimited engineering talent. These resources have to go somewhere. If you're putting them in battery swap, they're going there instead of somewhere else. Because I don't like battery swap as a concept, that's where to me it seems like a poor strategic decision when those resources could be put somewhere else, even if somewhere else is also just a nice to have feature. I think if you think about the EV ownership experience, the real luxury is having your car have a full charge whenever you want to use it. Having home charging or having charging where you're parking, that's the luxury, not going to a station, having to actually schedule your appointment to go get a battery swap every couple of weeks or something like that. And I know this is where people are going to say I'm ignorant about the China market, I'm ignorant about NEO. I do understand that NEO is working on these things as well. I know that they have mobile chargers that can go out and actually charge your vehicle wherever it's at if you want them to. And obviously they offer home charging solutions as well. I just think that every dollar they're putting towards battery swap is a dollar that they're not spending on building out that charging infrastructure, which I think will inevitably surface over the next couple of decades. And Neo has a chance now to do a little bit of a land grab in that space. I mean, these cars are parked somewhere. They have to be parked somewhere, regardless of whether it's next to a high rise or in a garage. They're parked somewhere and there's a way to get electricity to them. That should be the focus because that is going to allow for the ultimate convenience, the ultimate luxury long term that eliminates the need for battery swap for local travel, for long distance travel. I think high speed charging is always going to be a better solution because you run into the problem of distribution. You cannot have these extremely expensive battery swap stations at every single point that's going to be convenient. People talk about time savings. There's only going to be time savings if the swap station is exactly on your route at exactly the time that you need to swap. With the cost of a swap station, that's just an unrealistic expectation. Imagine there's a charging station two minutes away and the closest battery swap station is 10 minutes away. In that case, on a round trip, that's going to cost you 16 extra minutes to go to the swap station instead, plus the five minutes you have to sit there to swap your battery. That's assuming that no one else happens to also want to be swapping their battery at the same time. So best case, you would have actually spent less time if you just went to the charging station and charged for 20 minutes. For similar reasons, I don't think it adds much value to a robo-taxi, especially because a robo-taxi knows when it's going to be the lowest state of charge, and it can charge the most rapidly, most consistently. And then at the end of the day, you're just left with, okay, the upgradability might be the only reason left to have swap stations. You're not going to have thousands of these swap stations just so people can upgrade their battery once every 10 years. I'm not entirely convinced there's going to be enough demand for that anyway, but if there is, just go to a service center. Anyway, I'll conclude my thoughts on battery swap there, I'm sure by now. Many of you are sick of hearing about it, but there were a lot of similar comments yesterday, so I appreciate those again. 
Even though I disagree with them, I do appreciate it. And this is kind of my most effective way of responding. And again, just finally, one more time, I do need to reiterate, this doesn't mean I think Neo's gonna fail or Neo sucks or anything like that. I'm not trying to pretend I'm a subject matter expert on all things Neo. I'm just sharing my thoughts on a few specific elements of their strategy that I just happen to not agree with. And most importantly, sharing my reasons behind that so that you can hopefully think about some of those things and come to your own conclusion. And I very well could be wrong. I think the debate is healthy. You know, that's why I try to get Tesla bears on the podcast. I don't agree with most of what they say, but I still think it's good to have the conversation, consider things from a different perspective. So I'll again say, even though I'm pushing back on some of those comments, I do really, really appreciate them. So thank you for sharing. And that is where we'll leave it for today. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed, sign up for notifications. You can also continue the conversation with me on occasion on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And I'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, January 14th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.